Welcome everyone to Our Whole Lives Taking Flight. My name is Reverend Amy Johnson. I'm the Minister for Sexuality, Education and Justice at the United Church of Christ. And we are so excited to have Debbie Herbenick here today for Yes, Your Kid. Before we get there though, I wanna introduce other, other people who are here. My owl sister from another faith practice, Melanie. <laughs> At least you didn't say from another planet. <laughs> I'm Dr. Melanie Davis. I am the Unitarian Universalist Association's Our Whole Lives Program Manager, and happy to be here today with you and with Debbie. And I'm Debbie Herbenick. I'm a professor at the Indiana University School of Public Health, and I've been a sexuality researcher and educator for more than 20 years. And I uh, have published more than 200 articles about sexuality topics, um, largely about women's um, sexual health, about adolescent um, sexual behavior and questions that teenagers have about sex and really sexual behavior across the lifespan. So I um, recently published a new book called Yes, Your Kid, What Parents Need to Know About Today's Teens and Sex. And I'm really happy and honored to be here talking with you all today. Yes, we both have it right here at our fingertips. <laughs> um, and we recommend you have it too, just, just saying that right up front. Um, before we jump into this conversation though, I do want to invite you when you have questions today to please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen rather than putting your questions in the chat because it's so much easier for us to make sure we capture all those questions when they're in the Q&A. So please, um, please use that feature. Also, um, letting you know, and I'll hopefully say this again at the, the end of our time together today, but our April webinar will be a panel of reproductive justice advocates from, um, from our faith organizations. And so we really hope that you will join us for that. But today we have Debbie and we are so excited. And this book, Yes, Your Kid, is um, very comprehensive and really, I think, um, so timely, Debbie, uh, with questions that parents have and also helping them be prepared ahead of time, like we were talking before we, we started the webinar, um, how important it is to think ahead and have a plan for things that are probably likely um, going to be experiences your children and teenagers have, whether you want them to or not, right? So, um, so I think that this is uh, this is really a timely thing. And and can I just ask, like, where what prompted you to have your title for your book? I think is a good place to start. It's really difficult for me to choose titles when I write books and, and articles and so on. But um, for this book, I was joined um, by two women who are attorneys, Susan Stone and Christina Supler, and they are contributors to the book. And we decided to write this book together after talking for a few years. They see a lot of campus sexual misconduct cases, whether middle school, high school or college, as well as sexual assault cases. And like me, they had seen a lot of the big sea changes in adolescent and young adult sexual behavior and, of course, the exposures with pornography and choices kids have to make about taking and sharing nudes, for example. So they had seen a lot of these things happen and um, affect their cases. And they were trying to do a lot of parent sex education, just like I do a lot of um, community and parent and kids sex education. And we had all had a shared experience, which was that because so many of these things had changed, we would be trying to educate parents about them. And parents would often kind of say, yeah, those sounds, you know, those kinds of things sound really hard for those families. Like I'm so lucky my kid, right. Wouldn't, wouldn't think to do that or wouldn't do that. And I, I've just heard so many times my parent, my, my kids are just too into school. They, they really just use the internet to watch like you know, basketball or soccer videos or cute videos of kittens, but my kid's kind of just not into dating and sex. And we would sort of say, wow, like the thing is we, you know, Susan and Christina know the cases that they see. And I know the data that I see. And I'm a college professor. So I, I hear my own students' stories, not only about their recent lives, but about their adolescence. And so we know that whether or not um, most kids are doing some of these things, they are thinking about them. They are presented with options. They have a device and they have to kind of figure things out when somebody says, you know, can you send me a picture of yourself or, or pressures them to. So I think we were just trying to say to parents, like, 
Yeah. Even if you've opened up these conversations, even if you've tried to to engage your kid, you know, since day one, it doesn't mean that your kid is a bad kid, right? It doesn't mean that that there's something that it just means that yes, your kid too is being presented um, with a lot of these things. They're living in this world today, and we've got to step into the conversation. Yeah, and thank you. Oh, go ahead, Melly. Yeah. That's I think that's so important because um, that even they're in this milieu, right? Like you you said, so that even if this individual isn't now thinking about that. They're this pressure and how, you know, how can parents have conversations that kind of vaccinate their children against the peer pressure to, to do, to use these options, right? If, if they're not developmentally ready for them. I think too, um, uh, Melanie and I, we were, were in the middle, um, some of you know, of, of, uh, of revising many things, but one of them is as a visual component that, is optional for the seventh through ninth grade program. And we had a focus group last night. And one of the things that that we heard um, was, and, and, and I, I think this like um, ties into that idea of parents like, oh, not my kid, or I don't need to have these conversations or whatever, um, is that we heard that um, people who had seen these visuals um, we're saying, you know, I had this information and at the time, maybe even I, as a young teenager was like, I don't need to know that. But then I realized that actually now I was sort of inoculated, right? Like I didn't, now I don't feel the pressure to have to try these things. I don't feel the same pressure that my peers are feeling because I know that information, I saw that information. I understand that information. I've had discussions about that information. I have that information. And so I don't have to go now and do some of these experimental behaviors to find out about that because I already know. So I thought that was really, um, that was really telling. And I think that that is, is such a, um, such a, it, uh, an affirmation of why we do what we do and why we have lifespan sexual education in our whole lives and why we start, we have opportunity for, for um, people to start with kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in your book, you talk about that too, about setting the stage for um, just being able to talk about things. So can you talk a little bit about that, like for parents with young kids and, and what are some things to just set the groundwork? Yeah, I think, you know, the beauty of these conversations is they can start with really, really young ages. And I, you know, have always been a fan of parents even starting those, you know, getting comfortable with words like vulva and penis, even when you're diapering your kids. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be more for you than it is for them. But it gives you a chance to say like, all right, I'm going to, you know, wipe your vulva now, give you a dry diaper, then we're going to go play some more. And it just becomes really common for you to feel comfortable saying words like that out loud. And kids do learn to recognize words before they can speak them. So even older babies and young toddlers will start to learn those words. And when they are putting all their body part words together, they will get words like vulva and penis or bottom or whatever words that you choose to use. And I am a big fan of using words that other people can understand. Their teachers, yeah. their healthcare providers, so that they, you know, that they're not using really coded words, but words that others um, can understand. And so as you get comfortable, you can also have like nice age appropriate books around the house and you update them at different ages and stages. You read them together and then you get used to talking about their bodies, about consent, about boundaries um, and really reinforcing those messages. And they'll have different questions at different ages. And some of the questions are really, really funny and really, really fun. And so, you know, they're they're just a nice part of parenting too. You know, to your point, I was um, reading something about in in your book about boundaries and you know teaching about boundaries earlier. And and I'm thinking even you know we 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 talk to parents about you know ask people to ask permission before they hug your child. Um, but then the parents can also have boundaries and can say, you know, I, I really don't want you touching my chest when we're out in, in public, you know, when we're nursing at home, that's fine. But, you know, having, having those boundaries can go both ways so that children learn respect for other people's boundaries as well. Absolutely. And, and that's really good modeling for kids to see that, you know, even when kids find out, you know, different ways that babies are made and stuff, I know. 
Um, you know, it's really common for kids to have a lot of funny questions about it. And, you know, my friends and I would, you know, share the different kinds of questions we were getting about, like, when did, when did you make us? What day of the week was it on? Or what, you know, what room of the house? And, and these different questions that would come out. And it was such a great opportunity for, you know, myself as a parent and some of my friends who got these kinds of questions to say, well, like, that's a pretty personal question, you know, and I don't really remember what day of the week it was on or, or, or things like this, but, you know, but that was really a personal um, kind of question. So, you know, I can share with you that like, that is how you were made, but, you know, but I'm not going to go into detail about like my personal sexual life, you know, with yeah. your, your mom or dad. You know, and, that is a, oh, that's a, oh, that's a yeah, yeah, that's a, a, a tenant that one of our trainers um, brought forth and I've used countless times, which is that it's no, it's no secret that we are sexual beings, um, but how we're sexual is private. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's good for, for kids to see that you can, you can kind of put up a boundary, right. And it yeah. can be respected and it doesn't have to be, um, relationship breaking in any way. Um, you're really just kind of putting up the, the pieces that matter in a healthy relationship in a, in a good conversation. Yes. Everything doesn't have to be on TikTok, right? <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so let's get into some of the nitty gritty. I mean, you have some, you have some really lovely chapters laying the groundwork and some basic, um, ideas about being askable and, and how to have conversations with kids and the things about bodies and different ages. So there's, this is a, this is just a treasure trove of a book y'all really. Um, and then you get into some of the nitty gritty stuff around, um, technology and pornography and rough sex. So let's talk about some of that. You were talking um, earlier and you, you mentioned your colleagues who are attorneys and, um, and sexting and kids sending pictures. And, and I know that, um, so we had, um, we had recently done a revision and one of our authors was Canadian and there's completely different laws in Canada than there are in the United States. And of course, there's not one law in the United States about sexting. So um, please, over to you, Debbie. What can you tell us about um, some of the things that you think are highlights that that parents need to know about, yes, their kids? Yeah, you know, most kids have access to smartphones. Um, you know, certainly most 12-year-olds do, but a lot of younger kids do too, even if it's their parents' smartphone or their older siblings or cousins. So having some recognition that, you know, most kids are around connected devices that can take and share pictures. And they are growing up in a world where people take and share pictures all the time. And they're also kids who are naturally exploring their bodies. And that combination doesn't always work well. And so even at the earliest ages, a story I often tell is, you know, I was certainly well aware of this and had published research on adolescent sexting and was well aware how I was going to talk with my kids one day. But I wasn't prepared for, you know, one day finding when my when my oldest kid was a toddler going through my, I was going through my pictures and I saw a picture of myself standing um, just like, you know, wearing a bra um, in my closet. And I thought, what? Like, where, where did this picture come from? And I scroll around. And of course, it's one of like 90 pictures of like my kids' feet and the carpet and the, you know, just like all these things in the room. And, you know, it was probably one of those things because I keep my phone locked down. But if you turn it off for a second, you can still, of course, turn it on and, and take pictures. And it was a really good moment for me to see, even at toddler ages, that you can start to give messages about, you know, I found this picture and I know it was just an accident, but we just don't take pictures of people um, without their clothes on. And that became a foundational conversation over the years that we've built on, you know, in many different ways. And we've talked about taking and sharing pictures only with other people's permission. And, and that's led to great conversations, right? I mean, there was a time when I was taking, you know, some pictures at my kid's soccer game. And they said, wait, you don't have all those kids permission to do that. I thought, no. wow, I'm really glad you noticed that and thought about that. And yeah, what does it mean to be in a public space where you have some teams like this? And should this be an exception? Is it an exception? Or should we just say, let's sit back and enjoy it? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they're, they're like these things can come up, but we have to deal with it somehow. So, um, you know, there's new research recently out by Michael Cito, who's a wonderful sex researcher in Canada, and he focuses a lot on sex offending and, and sexting can be a way to get images into the world that end up being used in exploitative ways. 
So he came out with some research this past year, even showing how, you know, young kids like elementary age kids are being asked for um, nude images and many of them have sent them and some have also non-consensually shared them with others. So we have to be aware of this if they have any, you know, access to these devices so that we step into the conversations. I advise parents, you know, if they're dropping their kids off at other people's houses for play dates or sleepovers, talk about device access while we're there in a friendly way, right? Like, hey, this is a really important, you know, issue to my family. I just wanted to know if we could have a conversation about what kind of device access they may or may not have while they're here. You know, here's what our preferences would be. Or when kids come to your house, say, you know, I want you to know that while your kid is here, you know, we're just going to make sure like there's no device access, right? And and that's kind of how our family does things. You and know, that, that's such an important point, Debbie, because the first OWL class that I taught when we did the parent orientation, we asked, um, do, do you have filters on your TV? At the time, it was cable TV. And so we were asking if they had like the blocked channels and all the parents said, oh, yes, our kids can't access that stuff. And then when we actually met with the kids, we said, so how many of you have, you know, channels blocked on your TV systems? And most of them said they did, but they could go to their friend's house because their friends didn't have anything blocked. So it, it yeah. is important for parents to be aware that, you know, young people know workarounds. And they do. Yeah, it's, it's, it, yeah. I mean, I just think about like when we were, you know, we, my kids are much older. So like we were talking about this earlier, but I think that every generation has us like we used, ours was like, well, we only watch PG-13 movies at this age, but you go over to so-and-so's house and they're okay with watching our movies. So we have to have a conversation or, oh, I need to ask you if you have guns in your house. I didn't yeah. realize I needed to ask that, right? So I think it's really important to just lift this up as another thing. And even though it might feel like uncomfortable, you're you're saying that to another parent, um, it's important. It's important because of all of this research and all of these things that can happen and and being like you said can be very innocent people kids young kids are not accessing pornography necessarily on purpose right. but they're looking up a word that they heard yeah. on the playground that they don't understand and they know there's this thing called google and mm -hmm. they are they come across stuff that was not what they meant to find out about yeah, and if we haven't talked with them about that ahead of time, it can be really scary for them. Um, not all kids, but there are many kids who really, really feel frightened by what they've seen because a lot of the free mainstream pornography is very aggressive, especially toward women. And so for a seven or a nine-year-old to come across that and not understand what it is, but they probably by those ages know a little bit about sex. They might know that that is you know, the most common way babies are made, for example, and so many of them have some conception that one day they will be somebody who has sex. And if those are the early images they see, some of them feel scared by thinking, is that going to happen to me one day? Or am I going to have to do that to somebody else, to somebody who's like my friend or somebody I, you know, I love? And so that, I mean, and I don't want to sound alarmist at all about it, but even from colleagues who have raised their kids in really sex positive homes, when their kids have stumbled upon these things, sometimes at nine or 10 or 11, you know, I do know people who describe their kids having like actual nightmares um, about the things they've seen. And maybe the parent didn't know for some time what happened um, and what they, you know, what they saw. So if we can at least let our kids know again, in age appropriate ways, what, you know, for example, why we have certain rules about devices in our home, even just saying things like for the younger kids, like, just, you know, just like we're really careful about what shows or movies you watch, because some of them can give you nightmares. Just know that most of the stuff that's on the internet is made by adults for adults. And some of it would be scary to kids. That's, so that's actually that they, in the, we have a pornography workshop that's in our, uh, currently it's called Sexuality and Our Faith. It's a companion to our whole lives. And, and we present it that way. What I appreciated in your book is the very basic tell your kids you don't want them watching porn because I think often it's like well you know it's not you know it's not good you shouldn't you shouldn't but it's just I don't want you watching it That's it's not it's not for you just... yeah I we I was looking at you have a, a chapter about about porn and sexually explicit media mm -hmm. And uh, talking about media literacy and pornography literacy. And I thought that's just beautiful, right? To, to, to tease that out. We have a whole section on media literacy in our fourth through sixth grade. Yeah. 
curriculum because we know that kids need to understand that they're being manipulated, right? Yeah. And and so that that is not only about pornography, but about all kinds of things. And they don't like to be manipulated, right? So they're really, they love that. They love that session so much at that age, that like nine, 10, 11, they love thinking like, oh, I understand now that this is what this is happening. And these people are trying to manipulate me, even like Photoshop and that kind of thing, right? Just, just doing that critical thinking of, well, who's making this and what are they trying to solve? And what is it that they're trying to make me think about um, the attractiveness message uh, statistic about how many advertisers, how many attractiveness messages um, kids see every year, which is about a hundred a week. And, um, and that that is not, it's, it's attached to trying to sell people something so that you will want to be attractive in this particular way yeah. that this we not what you think is attractive but what we think you should think is attractive right um and then the porn li literacy about teaching them about media literacy and also reinforcing messages about healthy relationships and describe that, that what pornography is and that it's meant for only adults mm -hmm. and we do that as well not only in the fourth through sixth grade but also in the seventh through ninth and I think that that's really important. And I just want folks watching today to know that that's part of our, our whole life's curriculum to, to do some of that. But it doesn't take the place of you as parents doing that as well. And for parents whose kids are going through the our whole lives curriculum, which mine are, I mean, they're great conversations for me to have, you know, when I ask like what they've learned and how they've talked about it. And so we can keep expanding those conversations in our own families as well. Yeah. And, and I think also the idea of kids understanding um, some of the legal ramifications too, right? Of those pictures, that it's not okay to have them on your phone of somebody Yeah, else. it's not. I mean, you know, and you brought up the law before and in the US, about half of US states consider any images of minors, that, you know, sexual images of minors to be child pornography. So as Christina and Susan, you know, share some examples about, and yes, your kid, I mean, some of these kids are, you know, they may have done a very developmentally normal thing with taking in and sharing images between them and maybe a, a really established relationship partner even. But because they were teenagers, their images became um, seen as child pornography. And although it is rare for these kids to have to register as sex offenders, they do sometimes have to go to a trial and, and they do even if they don't have to go all the way to a trial and they're able to get like an educational diversion program or electronic monitoring or other things like that. You know, one thing that people don't always realize is just how many people end up seeing your picture. And, you know, I've, I spoke recently to a group of college students and one of them had a dad who was a school principal for a middle school. And she was just talking about how awful it's been for him over the years because he has had to see so many of his students nude pictures when they've gotten intercepted and he has to get involved as the principal and he has to report it. And then you have the law enforcement folks. And then they often involve right attorneys or expert witnesses or, you know, all the different people. And it can be a lot of people who see these pictures. And even just that process, even if at the end of the day, you go through an educational program, that is so stressful for kids to know that these images that they thought were private Right. are now being seen by so many grown-ups. So yeah. the way that our systems handle it is not, not really developmentally supportive um, in many cases, and it's really hard on kids. Well, I think that that's a point that brings out the, the importance of these conversations for parents to have, in addition to what we do in our whole lives, um, because this is not something that is is really getting addressed. It, as more schools are being told you can't talk about anything having to do with sex, they're certainly not educating about how to sex responsibly, right? And so parents have to pick up the slack. Yeah. And I think too how traumatic it just is at all for kids, right? And the and that in any sense of of anything being shared beyond what it was originally intended and the rumor mills that, you know, go among um, middle school and high school reputations and all that kind of stuff. It's just so, so, so traumatic for kids to be involved with that with something that they did never, like you said, they did never intend that. And even though, you know, adolescent brains aren't going to necessarily clock 
well, yeah, that could happen to me. Because I like that we know that about the adolescent brain development, right? We don't want to just scare the bejesus out of them because we know that doesn't work. But if we are setting the stage that it's okay to have conversations and that we are having conversations with them, even if we're a little bit uncomfortable, but we're laying that groundwork that, no, this is something I want to talk to you about and not freaking out when they do come to us. Um, I think that those are, those are really, um, really important life-changing skills. And that critical thinking part, you've mentioned, you mentioned that a few times in your book, Debbie, about just having them think about what is this for? Why is this happening? What is it that I want? What is it that I don't want? How can I communicate that with someone? So let's um, let's dive into that a little bit more and talk <laughs> talk about the the um, the rise and um, in in viewing of pornography and how that is becoming some kids' sex education and what some of the things that are problematic about that. Yeah, well, and I think whether it's watching pornography or taking or sharing images, one thing that's a really important message, and it goes along a bit with what you're saying, is the importance of not only not terrifying our kids, but letting them know that, you know, we don't want them to do some of these things, but also if they end up doing them, they can still come to us and we're still going to help them out because we don't want them to feel that they are so stuck um, and that they are doomed. Because people do say, right, they are, they're used to hearing, oh, digital footprints last forever. And they know that. Most of them know that, even if they don't really have the life experience to feel ramifications of it yet. So they might be hearing all these messages of doom and gloom, but we want them to know that we will do our best to help them through it and treat them as whole human beings, sometimes who do things that that they wish they maybe hadn't done or and so on. And I will say before we maybe move on more to pornography, it's just when when the sexting things do happen and if images wind up in the wrong hands, trying to keep the focus on the person who shared it non-consensually mm -hmm. rather than the person who took it. We too often as a society blame the person, like why would they have ever taken that? They never should have taken that or sent it. Well, what about the person who showed all their friends? Right. That's really you know what we need to be focusing on. Um, so I think with pornography, you know, it is it is such a shame that as a society, we are seeing sex education, you know, really continue to be gutted because we need it more than ever, especially with pornography being so accessible, so widespread, so much more aggressive than it used to be 30 years ago. And so we need um, to balance that with quality sex education. We need sex education to balance what kids are seeing on social media, what they're hearing in very popular songs. And we were talking earlier about Jack Harlow's Lovin' On Me that talks right. about choking and rough sex. Um, very popular shows for teenagers like Euphoria um, and more recently, The Idol. And so we've got to balance these things with really, really good comprehensive sex education. Um, but it's not the reality for many teenagers. Many of them just don't get that. And so they are. They are learning about sex from pornography and social media and shows. Yeah. And I think that you know, it used to be you You could say, well, I watch shows with my kids and I can put them into context. But so many parents are working multiple jobs and have so many other responsibilities that I don't know how many families actually get together and track what what their teens and, and adolescents are watching on TV. And then, and I think, unfortunately, what we're seeing, and Debbie, you point this out in your book too, is that is that it's now translating. There's research that it translates into sometimes um, behavior, and that people are having thinking that this is how I'm supposed to have sex. I'm supposed to choke someone. I'm supposed to slap someone, and um, and people who are young and experimenting and trying out things and learning about intimacy and kissing and hugging and those kind of things all of a sudden are involved in some pretty, can be, can find themselves involved in some pretty rough behavior. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, and this is my my passionate area of research these days. I'm I'm just it's actually the reason I wanted to write this book was to get this information to parents. Um even though all the other chapters matter too, I thought this is information that no one else is talking about um and we need to. And so what we are seeing and we've been doing research on this for maybe about 6 or 7 years now is that many young adults, I mean most young adults and many teenagers 
are now engaging in a variety of rough sex behaviors with choking, which is a form of strangulation being the most common. And, um, and then also the most risky in terms of health. And I'll say that when we first wrote this book and passed it around to some parents in the draft stage, you know, some parents came back and said, whoa, that chapter seven rise of rough sex is like, it's hard. It's hard to read that because it's hard to see the numbers and realize that actually lots of young people are, are engaging in these. And maybe, you know, many parents don't know that they're supposed to be talking with their kids or that it would help their kids to hear from them about it. Because what's happened is these kinds of um, sex have become so prevalent so quickly. In my 25 year career as a sex researcher, I haven't seen a big change like this before. So they become really quick, um, really popular and prevalent quickly. And many adults don't realize that. And so if we don't realize it, we're not talking to young people about it, but it doesn't mean no one is. They are hearing about it from Jack Carlo's Love Non Me. Again, number one song in the country, right? For six weeks of the last few months, talks about choking. The first two episodes of The Idol with popular stars like The Weeknd and Lily Rose Depp that are really popular among young people showing choking and smothering in a way where actually in the first episode, he says, you know, do you trust me? And she says, no. And then he does these things. And it's it's really portrayed as a very sexy, sensual scene. So we have to talk about these because they do get the sense that it's really normative and that is how you have sex. And although some of it, you know, is fine in the sense that people are walking away saying, no, I like that or that's okay with me. A lot of young people are also feeling really harmed and scared, and we're not talking enough about that. Well, I think, uh, Debbie, before we went live, you were uh, talking about the statistics of people um, being, and let's call it what it is, strangulating, being strangled during sex, um, and the brain damage that uh, that arises out of that. And I think that, um, you know, how do we balance um, parents' wanting to give their teenagers privacy and not get overly involved in their their uh, teens' sex lives or intimate lives, and yet also making sure that they're avoiding these behaviors that can literally lead to dementia and other kinds of brain damage. Yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Um, but I think I do think we have to. And I, in my own experience as a college professor and someone who talks with young people, I find that they're actually really glad someone's talking with them about it. Um, and more often what I hear, especially from young women, since they're most often the ones who are on the receiving end of being choked or slapped or, or a whole bunch of other things, is they often say, how come no one talked to us about this before? How come I'm only hearing about this now? And they do tend to be really receptive to messages about safer ways that they can explore their sexuality, that they can maybe even play with power or feel submissive or whatever the thing is that they want to get out of their sexual experience, but that they can do it in a way that is not likely to heighten their risk for mental health problems later on um, or brain damage or other things. And, um, you know, I find it a little tricky because I mean, I grew up, I was a teenager in the 90s, and it's not like nobody had heard of things like erotic asphyxiation would have been the term at the time. <laughs> Excuse me. But there was a sense, even back then, that it was dangerous and not to right. do it. And they were, it really only came up when like there were some celebrity deaths, for example, related to this. So a lot of people my age and, and older, it's not that they've never heard of it, but whether inside or outside of the kink community, there was just a sense that this was better left alone. And even in the kink community, the books from the 80s and 90s will say, you know, stay away from erotic asphyxiation, right? There's other ways to, to explore sexually. So it's been really surprising to many of us how prevalent this has become. And if you Google, for example, um, you know, things like how to choke somebody during sex, and we've we've done this where we've Googled it. We found 27 articles a couple of years ago that were talking about this. We analyzed them to find out what messages are they sharing? And many of them do say, sure, people can die. But then they say, but here's the safe way to do it. And so there's this overwhelming message that there are safe or proper ways to do it. And, um, and that's not true. Right. And so we're sending yeah. really inaccurate messages to young people. I 
wonder, um, I know in your, your, you have a section in your book about misogyny. And um, it just occurred to me as you were, you, you use that term auto asphyxiation. My first introduction to that term was when um, I think it was, was it David Carradine or Keith Carradine? One of the Carradines died from uh, attempting that practice. But at the time, it was promoted as something that would increase your um, sexual, like your orgasm experience. But it seems that now it's become more about power and control and and submission as opposed to pleasure. Do, do you Does that make sense or am I crazy for thinking about that? You know, when we ask people why they engage in choking, they mostly tell us in our research um, because it's either just how sex is. So um, it's just kind of what you do. It's a normative part of sex. They do it almost every time they have sex or make out with somebody. Um, or because it's kind of feels kinky or adventurous, um, exciting. Uh, so yes, reasons of arousal or orgasm are actually pretty low. And when we went into it, I thought they would have been higher because of exactly what you said. That was kind of the message that would come along with some of these, these articles about, you know, a celebrity having having died and the, and then the media would provide some spin on it, whereas like this is why some people do it, but it's really dangerous, so don't do it. Yeah, we actually haven't found much around um, like making orgasm easier or things like that. There's some, um, but it seems to be to me more about like a sense of how, how, how you become a sexual person, right? Like what it means to be a sexy sexual person today. Um, young people will also often talk about being worried about being vanilla shamed is the term or being made to kind of seem like you're like boring and bad or you're not exciting enough and bad. And especially for young women, there can be that pressure to feel like you have to be exciting enough to keep a partner. And so um, so there are those sort of unspoken pressures where even if a particular person isn't trying to get you to do these things, you kind of feel like to be sexy, you should. Um, so you know, I, I would love, I see the question about what resources for making sure the conversations aren't shaming. I mean, I, I hope that my book is a good resource. I would love to give you five other resources, but yeah. the thing is, this is just emerging. Um, one other one that I mentioned in there is called In the Know. It's a website um, out of New Zealand. And they um, used some of our research early on, which I was so excited about. And they're a youth organization in New Zealand. So they also worked directly with teenagers and very young adults um, on these materials. So they have free online resources on pornography, on rough sex, and even on choking specifically because they were seeing these same things in their community, just like we have been here. And they wanted to get materials directly to young people. So I think that those are really nice, especially because they were created with young people using words and images and information. But there's also some videos with healthcare providers, for example, who explain why being choked is not good for the brain and why it's risky. Um, so yes, I think In the Know is a wonderful one. Um, it's Time We Talked is also a great resource out of Australia. It's more pornography focused. Um, but especially for communities that aren't able to touch too much on pornography, um, and OWL does this as well, like being able to give families resources to say, even if our school or community isn't going to do this, we can do this here. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, having different resources like that available to you can figure out how you have the conversations in ways that don't shame them, especially because they're just young people living in this culture. And they are getting all the messages around them that this is just how you have sex. They haven't done anything wrong by believing that these messages are true. They're just a product of their culture. You know, they're they're not. And, and so we, we, can, we can give them more positive messages so that they can choose a different path. And that's what my college students often say is like, you know, I've learned that there's lots of ways I can be sexual and I can choose ways to be sexual that aren't so risky to me. And that feels empowering to them. There, right. there was a comment in the chat. Uh, uh, somebody who is a singer was mentioning that that strangulation can also hurt the larynx and the voice box. So if 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 young people aren't worried about their brains when they're fifty, they might be worried about uh, damaging their throat. Um, yeah. I think one of the things that was striking for me, Debbie, is your conversation about how many people have this happen to them without any advanced conversation? So it's not a consensual thing. It's just done to them, a slapping, choking, uh, 
whatever, th you know, and I wonder if you could talk a bit about that, uh, the incidence of that non-consensual or, or maybe it's unaware, you know, it's, it's just thrust upon somebody. Yeah. So all of that. So I, I do want to acknowledge the voice box thing too. I and mean, we've published a study that shows a whole range of side effects um, and symptoms from being choked. And in fact, in one of our studies recently, we had a, a college voice major who said that her voice was, you know, was changed from being choked and so on. So, so that also has real implications for her academic career yeah. for her professional career later on. And so, yes, there are voice changes that people experience. There are, um, you know, changes to the brain, heightened risk of mental health issues later on. So we really do need to be talking about this with young people. Um, and um, in terms of the non-consensual thing, it's a little tricky because what we mean by consent, uh, consent or consensual isn't always the same thing that young people mean. Um, and so I want to just put that out there first. What we have found in our studies is that around two thirds of college women um, have ever been choked during sex. By the time they're seniors in, in college, it's going to be around 80 percent. Um, and we found that it used to be a few years ago that one out of four of those people would have been choked um, for the first time as teenagers between ages 12 and 17. Our newest data show it's about 40% were choked as were choked um, first as teenagers. So we see it happening younger and it's happening more regularly. Um, most of this is described as consensual, but in interviews when we talk with them about what that means, it usually means it happened and I was okay with it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone talked about it in advance. Um, it might mean that they've been choked before and they just accept this as part of sex. And so they wouldn't even expect anyone to talk about it. And that's true for some people. Um, but for others, it means that like, no, like they were completely surprised and taken aback or even really scared by it. So we have interviewed people who, even if they came to accept it or to enjoy it, which some say that they, they do end up feeling that way, their initial experiences can be really frightening. And so I do think, you know, it's important to, to find ways into these conversations, whether they're through teachable moments like the media that young people see um, or conversations about pornography. But it's just so prevalent where we now see young people experiencing this often without conversation. And again, most of them aren't even trying to harm another person. Right. But they are seeing this in pornography or in social media or someone asks them to do it and they do it. And sometimes they do it harder than the person expected or for longer, not often, but sometimes people pass out or much more often feel close to passing out. And that can feel scary. And so in terms of preventing harm and supporting people and thinking about like, who do I want to be as a sexual person? Um, you know, those conversations are key because I, I, you know, often think of this one 19 year old I interviewed for a study last year and she was incredible, right? She clearly had gotten so much better sex education than most young people do. And her communication was wonderful. Um, and she had, you know, a trans masculine partner who she had been with for a long time, but her partner really from day one wanted her to do things to him that she really didn't love. And she was willing to do them because he liked them. Um, but after more than a year of that, and as part of the interview in our research, she said, you know, I don't really like this word, but it's how I feel. So I'm going to say it. She said, I just keep asking myself, is this really the kind of lover I want to be? And I don't think it is. And so I loved that she was self-reflecting, right? I love that we were able to have that space together where she could kind of explore that. And as, and as great as she was as a communicator, I mean, really better than like most adults I know, she still didn't feel like she could share that with her partner. So we also still have that work we've always had to do which is supporting young people in asserting, not in first like reflecting, being aware, and then communicating and asserting what is or isn't okay with them. Yeah, I think that's um, you know like you like we talked earlier like you don't as parents we don't always know what questions we need to ask when our kids are going somewhere about devices, and so here are some more questions that we need to teach kids, young people youth and young adults to be asking each other about um, when they're talking about consent and they're talking about having sex to be able to say, you know, up front, like, I don't, I don't know about that choking thing. I don't think I want to do that. You know? Yeah. 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 Um, we do have um, 
so important. I just want to say so important, such important conversations. Um, we do have a couple of things in the Q&A that are, uh, one is related saying um, in one piece of research, 61% of youth said they had, if had they known the consequences of sharing nude pictures or distributing child pornography, they would likely not have done it. So yeah, that is important for us. They do need to know. And it's important for us to say that. So um, um, seeing something else in the chat here. Um, yeah, it's hard. I think the, the thing is also to talk about, um, like you said, Debbie, having that person verbalize, is this the kind of lover I want to be? So again, like talking with people too, like, do you want to be the one doing the choking? Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. So it's, um, so it's important to, to talk about about this from uh, from all to all genders and all partners saying like, if you're gonna, if that's something you think your partner might like, or you think you wanna do, it's really important to get consent. And I mean, it's not even, that's even like saying that it come out of my mouth. I'm like, I don't even wanna go there. I wanna say like, no, don't yeah. even do that. Like, it's, well, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, there there was so some, hard. somebody put a comment in, in the chat that there's no way that the person who is doing the act can tell what the impact is on the person who's receiving it. And I think that that's really important. Yeah. So it's it's more of like, if you're thinking you want to do this choking, think again, because you don't know what's going to happen to the person. And, and there are some long-term consequences that you can't see while you're doing it. There are. And if the person has a history of seizures, for example, they're going to be at higher risk of, of health risks. You know, if they have cardiovascular problems that you don't know about. I mean, there's all sorts of things that that really most people aren't talking about with one another. And frankly, there are some places around the world, there's a couple of states in Australia and also in the UK that have now uh, that now have laws against even consensual strangulation. Yeah. Now they're still early enough that we don't know how they're going to be applied. I, I do have some concerns about laws like that, if they could be differently applied to people based on their, you know, their race, their ethnicity, ethnicity, their sexual orientation. I mean, all sorts of the ways that we know laws about sex sometimes are not applied evenly. Um, and, and, you know, and they may only be applied when things go really wrong, right. In the case of injury or death, but it's um, but I understand the desire for them because too often people who are committing strangulation as part of domestic violence, for example, would use a rough sex defense and say, Oh no, the person wanted me to do this to them. Right. So I understand that these laws can sort of, um, you know, get rid of that loophole for people who are trying to get to get out of big offenses. But, um, but I found that even my students, there there are cases where usually women have accidentally died from being choked during sex, and they do seem to be really like sex cases and not domestic violence kinds of cases. And in those cases, you know, there are men who are sitting in prison today because of that. And um, and so sometimes I have even brought those articles to my students as points of discussion mm -hmm. and those and it's not again, not to scare them, but to deal with the reality of what's happening that now as these has, these things have become really common that sometimes this is happening in the US and Australia and the UK and other places. And I will say that some of my students say, wow, like you need to share this with more of us because yeah. with the big focus on consent in recent years, some of them actually say we thought that as long as something was consensual, it was yeah. okay. Right. And this actually sort of makes them realize that consent is, as I say in Yes, Your Kid, it's the bare minimum, yeah. right? It is the bare minimum for like legally permissible sex. It's not about, consent is not enough to address like pleasure and enjoyment um, and people connecting and all the other things that actually most people do want from sex. So um, even making sure young people understand that consent is one piece of it, but especially for behaviors that could harm somebody, it's really not enough. Yeah, no. for, for yeah. people who are um, perhaps listening, who use the older adult curriculum from OWL, um, the last workshop, the first half is about sex toys and the second half is about kink. And we include conversation about contracting about behaviors because the kink community by and large, is good about communicating, okay, if you want me to spank you, how hard do you want me to spank you? And, and having that very open communication. And, and I'm not advising that people who teach some, you know, the middle school, I'll use that contract, but, but to know that it exists, that that level of communication of, okay, I'm, I'm consenting to 
having sex, what does that mean? To How do I define that? Is that making out? Is it outer course? Is it oral sex? Is it whatever kind of sex people might have? And I think we need to encourage parents to help their young people really think through what all that means. Just saying, you say no to sex isn't really helpful. No. And, and I think, um, it, it, so to that point of the, the, another, another question that's in the, in the question, um, Q and A, does all this lie on the shoulders of parents or do we bear some responsibility to evaluate where we draw the lines of what topics are age appropriate and when and all? Yeah, I think, well, I think certainly that, um, that our whole lives facilitators, those of you who are on and trainers, um, definitely you may get questions in, que in the question box about it. And then um, this is definitely, you know, information for us to be aware of as we're, you know, updating and revising curricula to, to be able to put some particular information in there about um, a speaking with youth directly about things that can be dangerous that are dangerous, that are potentially life-threatening, that are risky, and um, and um, how to have conversations about those things um, and to give information, right? Because what I'm hearing from you, Debbie, is that when people have information, they're like, oh my gosh, people need to know about this, right? So, um, and they need to hear it from trusted adults, I think is the key, right? So there's this, I think, as you were talking about like, um, I think there's a difference between um, being scared and being ashamed, right? So I think that there's some there's a part of this around choking that I don't think that it's inappropriate for people to feel scared about being choked. It's a scary thing. That research is scary. There's you know there's memory loss. There's physical there are physical ramifications of doing that. And so that's an, so it, do you really know what you're, if you think you're quote consenting, do you really know what you're consenting to? And I think the answer and is a resounding no, most people don't know what they're saying yes to if they're agreeing to be choked. Um, and so I think that, 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 that level of fear is not necessarily a bad thing, right? But if it spirals into like, we're just shaming people for something they enjoy or something that they um, feel as part of being a sexual person, that's different. So that's that, that's that right. sort of threading the needle there, right? Giving, giving people information that's important and medically accurate from trusted adults um, to engage their critical thinking so that they can make better, healthier decisions. Um, to, to help them do that, in the chat, I am putting the link to our free program, Parents and Caregivers as Sexuality Educators. And while it does not mention the risks that we've just been talking about, it, it can be used as a tool to help parents have conversations and think about the messages that they want to provide. I put the link for the UU version. Amy, can you put the link for the UCC um, version? I'm finding it right now. Yes. And if we have any people from secular settings, it's easy enough to extract the faith content from, from these workshops and use it. Um, they can be used online or in person. Um, I wanted to, um, we're getting toward the top of the hour and I'm doing two things at once, which is trying to find this link for you all and talk about what's coming up. Um, but there was an, a question about the K-1 um, availability and curriculum uh, for the, the faith inclusion pieces on that. So I just wanted to address that really, um, really quickly here as, as I share this link. Um, so that's the UCC version in the chat. <clears throat> um, and if you're not, if you're watching this afterwards, you can go to uccresources.com and search for parents and caregivers and you'll find it. It's a free download. Um, so I want to say that um, a couple things. For those of you that don't know, we are moving formats. We've moved formats um, with the K-1 revision and all the revisions that come out after this, like the new 10th through 12th grade will be in this format where you get a, a um, shrink wrapped group of three hole punched pages that are paginated in a way that will help us be able to update things more quickly. So the first that came out um, in that format was the K through one, just regular owl. And we are working, we, we have um, 
we are working in real time with uh, the wonderful and amazing Mary Bernard at the UUA pubs uh, to get the, that faith material published. So we're working on that. Um, it, it's and it's just it's out of our hands basically. We have we've done our part. We've developmentally edited. We've said all the things, and it's now in that that sort of pipeline and that that process of getting proofread and getting um, getting formatted and all those things before it can actually be physically ready. So that's where that is. And and I, when we don't, I'm sorry, we don't have a date for you. And we're just just um, really um, feel like we've given you the information that we thought we had and it's changed so many times that we're just leery of giving you a date because we think it'll probably end up being wrong that that's also <laughs> true with the 10 12 uh, yeah. which we thought we were done and then we decided you know we want to make sure that we're really reaching the goals that we want to reach and so we um, engaged a private consultant who specializes in evaluating sex ed curricula and got really good grades. We're very happy, but now we, we, you know, we have to incorporate all those changes before we can send it off to publications. But, but it, what that ensures, yes, it's delayed, and it ensures that when it's in everybody's hands, it is the best possible product that we can provide. Yeah, and then, and then again, moving ahead as we as we do move to that new format, the um, the impetus for that would be that that updating material would be easier. And so it, it, as we're having these conversations, I'm sure Melanie and I are going to get off of this call and have a conversation about like, what questions do we need to add to that 10 to 12th grade yeah. curriculum? Yeah. We around. have around. to let go of perfectionism yeah. at some point. So, so understand folks that when you get the reprint of seven to nine, which will have all the recommended updates incorporated into it, um, you know, we struggle with our own want, our own desire to be perfect and to get everything in there. And it is never going to be perfect because as Debbie knows, every sex researcher, researcher knows it's a, it's an evolving environment, right? And, and everything keeps changing the, the, the next time you look at something and, and try to do it differently. So we do our best and, um, and we, we're working as fast as we can. So. If you do not already have this book, please go get this book. It is so good. It has so much information in it for you. If you are a parent of any age child, if you are uh, our whole lives facilitator for any age, um, this has just an enormous amount of fantastic information, great advice about how to normalize conversations about everything from bodies to sexting to pornography to rough sex in it so I, I i just i don't know another resource out there like this one so thank you so much debbie i'm so glad that you you wrote the book yeah and and i think that if if programs have the money to provide these books like this to families or at least have a copy in your church or congregation's library that would be fabulous um or you know, for those of you who have service auctions, donate a copy to the service auction and let people bid on it and raise lots yeah. of money. Yes. Debbie, thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for the conversation. This has been really lovely. Yeah. And um, and I also just want to, again, tell you that uh, in April, we will have um, a panel of reproductive justice advocates in faith organizations. Um, so we hope that you will join us again. And um, and we're working on uh, some some fun things for May as May is Sex Ed for All Month. So stay tuned for more information about that. Um, Laura, thank you so much for getting all these links in the um, in the chat. Hopefully, those of you who are uh, following that can grab them, and we will also put those um, with the with the recording of this webinar. Um, when we post it on our playlist. Thank you all so much for being here today. And, um, and thank you for all the good work you do. And again, thank you so much, Debbie. Take care, everybody. Thank you all. I love seeing all the little parts of that. <laughs> Yeah.
you were quick on those <laughs> those links today. Thank you. Yeah, trying to be. <laughs> have a good little list to go out and try to looks like most of the folks are out of here yeah get into your last few a couple more yeah there you go nice if you guys want to chat i'm happy to um make one of you host and hop off Okay. Wait, we can probably stop the recording. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> um,